bless you guys. Everyone have a seat. Well, I'm sure your day has been busy for most of you and go, go, go. And um, then, then you're here. It's a lot in our lives sometimes, but I want to encourage you that this time is that time where you get to quiet yourself, where you get to let God, you know, search your heart and speak his love into your life. It's the time where um, we get to receive. And, and I feel like when we're looking at God's word, we're just seeing God's face. We're learning who he is and we're learning all the lines that are there and all the parts that are there. And that is a gift to be able to do. If he didn't leave his word, where would we be? So tonight, just relax. I'm going to pray that we're able to put all the worries and concerns and stress and anxiety behind us and just linger with him. Will you pray that with me? All right, Father, I do pray that you would help each and every one of my sisters and myself to be able to put at your feet cast our cares there, our fears, our worries, the problems that we're facing, Lord, the needs that we have at the feet of the one who has the answers, who has grace for us and help for us in time of need. We cast those things to you, and now we just want to look at your face from your word. So come and speak to us and reveal yourself to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome. I'm Vanita. I'm excited to get into the Word with you. Everybody, open up your Bibles or your devices and turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I'll give you, while you're looking that up, I'll give you a few things to know. I have broken this Bible study up into three segments. Verses 1 through 3 is from death to life. Verses 4 through 10 is seated in the heavenlies or in heavenly places. And verses 11 through 22, he is our peace. And the overall title of this teaching is seated in heavenly places. We're going to jump right in because our time is precious. All right. Um, in chapter 2, this chapter, Paul is going to say that the same power that, that caused sinners to move from death, eternal death, to eternal life are transformed into saints. And that's exciting news. So from death to life, let's read verses 1 through 3. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the, the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires, and the flesh, uh, uh, desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. The Bible, this, I don't know about your Bible, but some Bibles will show um, the words he made alive in italics. And the reason for that is because this passage didn't originally have those words, but it's indicated from the passage. Uh, so it's added to the text because it's implied in the text. So that's a little translation thing right there. Now, using these descriptive words, dead and alive, provide a vivid contrast for us between the believer's old previous condition outside of Christ and her current privileged position through her salvation experience. So Paul explains that before we knew Christ, our spiritual condition was dead. Dead is the biblical diagnosis of a fallen people and a fallen society everywhere. It's kind of creepy when you think about it, right? Talk about zombies, right? <laughs> the walking dead. There's people all around are spiritually dead without Christ. And so he uses that term dead to describe the state of being lost or unregenerated. And so these terms signify that people are alienated from God, that there's a separation between them and God because of trespasses and sins. We were dead. When we ask Christ in our life, it's a past thing, not a present thing. If you're a Christian, I'm sure you have a testimony, a story of before you receive Christ. And some of you may have shared that in your group last week. I know our group did, and it was just so sweet. We older Christians have a little, you know, saying that we say about our past life before Christ. We call it our BC days, right? How many know that saying? Thank you. 
not alone in that. <laughs> Our BC days are before Christ, before we knew him, while we were still entangled in sins and trespasses. I have to have some water. Okay, so trespasses is plural, which speaks of our, our individual, individual acts of sin. It speaks of the fact that we are responsible for our separation in Christ, or I mean separation from God. Trespasses may be defined as a lar or lapse or deviation from truth and uprightness, a lapse from it. You have not lived that way. So, have you ever trespassed on somebody's property? Snuck behind that gate or that chain that they had there and you just gotta go and let your dog run or take a picture? Well, guess what? Then you understand what it is to trespass. It means to basically um, enter into an area where you have no right or no permission to be. And so, that's how we are. When we're in our trespasses, we've, we've broken the rules, right? Um, that's what tra trespassing is. It means to go astray, and it means to break God's laws. Now, sin has a different definition. Sin gives us a comprehensive account of all human evil, and it's, de it's defined as to violate God's law, to miss or wander from the path of uprightness and honor, or simply to do wrong. What is considered wrong would be really, a, <laughs> from A to Z, opinion on people's minds, right? What's considered wrong. But what is considered wrong is always based on God's holy standards rather than man's ever-changing ideals and opinions and values. So please understand this. Humanity began in a spiritual condition of alive, Alive, Adam and Eve were spiritually alive. They were free from the power of sin and death. Once they disobeyed, took the fruit of the, tr of the tree of the uh, knowledge of good and evil, all humankind after that was born in sin. Romans 5.12 says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Even King David understood this concept when he wrote Psalm 51, uh, 5. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Well, I just had two grandbabies, and I think they're probably the only ones that never did sin. They are pretty perfect. <laughs> but we look at an innocent baby like that. How could you be in sin? It is passed on. It's just passed on from Adam's sinful condition and on to all people. So, Paul explains to us in verses 2 and 3 that our old condition before we knew Jesus was conformed to this world. We were conformed to the world around us, and the world represents humanity who willfully reject God, the Father, and Jesus the Son. They reject their authority, and by default, they worship Satan, the God of this world. You know, I see my neighbors and different family members that they're not saved. And I would never say, well, they're Satan worshipers. <laughs> you know? Look at them, evil people. They're just people. But if you aren't um, in fellowship with God, then you're outside of fellowship with him. And there's no other thing left than to be following Satan. Until you receive Christ, you are on that course of following Satan. So, whether we know it or not, that's the situation. First John 5, 19 says, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Satan is constantly uh, pouring out his evil influence in order to sway people, in order to sway them his way. And he affects people's beliefs, their moral standing, their thinking, their behavior. Every single day, they're moving and acting along with him. So, with the rejection of God's values, um, the world's ethics and values spiral downward. Do you see it going downward, or is, are things getting better in human nature? Well, let me hear. Better or worse? Worse, way worse, spiraling down. And in God's wrath, which is his holy hatred for sin, he will judge. 
and penalize those for their sins if they don't come to Christ. That's that open door to be forgiven and saved and be brought close to God. But if you haven't come, been brought close to God through Jesus Christ, you are children of wrath. As a Christian living in this world, we still continue to be subject to Satan's attempts to sway us, don't we? The aim of demonic forces are to defeat our walks and to you know, stumble us in our commitment to Christ. Are you aware of this? Are you attentive to the fact that he is coming after you as demonic forces are to move you away from your life in Christ? Don't give the devil a foothold. When I was young, we had a lot of uh, you know, door-to-door salesmen because you know, I'm old, so yeah, we had those. <laughs> We had uh, those who sold encyclopedias. We had those who sold vacuums. Um, there was an array of brushes. Does anybody remember the Fuller Brush Man? Yes, very good. We had just the nicest. My mom got a great vacuum from Kirby. Those things live forever. It's like you finally want to get rid of it because you're just tired of it, but it actually still works, you know? Those brushes, too, were fantastic. We also had milk delivery. It's such so quaint, right? But we still have door salesmen at our doors, don't we? They're selling solar and pest control and security. And boy, can they talk your face off. When one is knocking on our door, I'm, tell, I'm already telling my husband, he's going over, I'm like, be strong. You know? Get out of there as fast as you can. We don't need it and we can't afford it you know, because they're so convincing and they know how to hype up their product. And some of them really do believe in their products, some of them. (laughs) So they have a way to sway us to buy what it is, you know, they're trying to sell. And the devil is like that. He's like a door-to-door salesman. He's seeking a strategic position in your life. He's not going to rob you of your salvation, but he can sure tempt you into something that you don't belong doing or distract you, find something to add to your life that doesn't bring any value to it, spiritually especially, or a deception or a lie, even discouragement. The enemy uses discouragement. That, 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 that you know, where our heart just hurts and, and we feel we have loss of hope and we don't believe something good could come out of the situation that we're in. We're just discouraged. We've lost the courage to keep going on is what discouraged means. And Satan uses discouragement to pull us away from the Lord. When my kids were little, we used to sing with them the song, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down with love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little tongues, what you say. Then be careful, little hands, what you do. Be careful, little feet, where you go. Be careful, little heart, whom you trust. Be careful, little mind, what you think. The Father is up above and he's looking down with love. Be careful. Be careful. The enemy is gunning for you. You probably felt it this week every time you tried to do your homework (laughs) and just getting here tonight. The Holy Spirit is there to help you, to strengthen you, to help you overcome the attacks of the enemy. And he also brings conviction when the temptation comes and the desire to move away from Christ comes. And we're, we're not just going, I'm going to move away from Christ today. You know, I'm packing my bags. You know, no, it's not like that. But one decision after the next can draw us away when those decisions aren't biblical and righteous. And it's his ploy to pull you away. So it's so important that we slam the door on Satan and his tactics. Yes, as it says here in our former life, our life was full of trespasses and sins. But in our new life, our new life in Christ, we should be moving forward in the opposite direction into more and more holiness. That's always a mind-blowing thing that you consider, are you more holy today than you were a year ago? Think about that. Am I more holy today than I was a year ago? Am I moving forward or am I moving backward? Because living or being alive in Christ means we are more than conquerors in Christ. And we should be moving ahead as we connect with the Lord and he empowers us to do that. So I encourage you, be watchful. 
So verses one through three show us that people without faith in Christ are dead in their sins and trespasses and by nature children of wrath. But those who trust Christ are regenerated. They're born again from death to eternal life. Now let's move to verses four through 10 sitting together in heavenly places, and I'm gonna start by reading verses four and five. I so encourage you to follow along when I'm reading on your Bible or device because, you know, these, are, these, these scriptures are very weighty, aren't they? It's kind of shocking <laughs> what they're saying. There's so much. But as you follow along with me, it'll get in more and more ingrained in you, and it'll help you follow me when I'm teaching about it too. So verse four, but God who's rich in his mercy, because of his great love, which he has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. So it says God is rich in mercy. Sinners are saved because we're for, God's forgiveness has been extended to us through a wealth of mercy. So just what is mercy? Well, mercy in the Greek is defined as kindness and goodwill toward the miserable and afflicted. That was us spiritually before we knew him, miserable and afflicted, joined with the desire to help them. That describes our God. That's looking in his face, isn't it? The dictionary definition is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. So God, it is within his power and even right to punish and harm those who are separated from who are living a life of sin. But it's his desire that, that he share his love and compassion with you, his, his mercy, and show forgiveness to you. Mercy is aptly defined as not getting what you deserve, not getting what you deserve. Therefore, mercy describes the heart of God providing and offering people salvation in Christ instead of judgment for sin. Psalm 103, 10 through 12 says, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens, um, for as high, for as the high, I'm so sorry. <laughs> for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy, mercy toward us who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed your transgressions from us. You know, I couldn't point to you south, east, north, nothing. Literally, I have no ability to find my way around. There's a reason I got the husband I did that. One of the reasons is he can find his way anywhere. I am lost in a paper bag, so please give me a ride to the retreat. No. <laughs> it's terrible. So listen, I remember when I saw this verse and it was just literally giant question mark over my head. What does that even mean? Because I didn't know. And I'm gonna share it with you right now. How far is the east from the west? Well, if you were to take a jet plane and you had unlimited fuel in it, you could start heading east. And you could continue going east forever forever because east will never meet west. So in other words, this phrase that uh, as far as the east is from the west would mean that our sins and God would be infinitely apart, never to come together again. That's how he forgives us so thoroughly that th God and our sins are never going to meet again. Praise you, Jesus, man. This is exciting. So there's no better analogy than this absolute act of forgiveness shown through East and West. When God forgives, he forgives completely. Our shame is gone forever. Our guilt is pardoned forever. Our debt has been paid forever. We have been set free from the transgressions of all eternity and that's God's mercy. This is how we are positionally with God. Do you sin now and do you need to get right with God? Yes, you do. But positionally, and that's what this whole study is about, where we sit positionally, the blessings and the inheritance we've received in Christ, where you sit spiritually because of your faith in Christ is holy and blameless and guilt-free. Praise him for that. So what prompted God to act so mercifully on our behalf? Verse 4 tells us it was his great love for us. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Now verse 5 points back to verse 1. Even when we were in our filthiest condition, dead in our sins, 
we were made alive. This act of God to, is regeneration of man. It means that they've been given new birth, that we've been given new birth through the power of resurrection, God's resurrection power. Never be fooled that you can or you did clean yourself up in any way to be good enough for the Lord. Never believe that, and some do believe those things, but it could never be true. We could never be clean enough and pure enough and righteous enough before the holy God. Holy, holy, holy. That's who he is. First and foremost, I believe the chief attribute of God is his holiness. And we cannot ever measure up. We could never deny ourselves enough or do enough good deeds. And so don't be fooled that you can. And guess what? You don't have to. <laughs> Jesus died in your place for your sins. It's so encouraging. So verse five underscores this thought by saying, for by grace you have been saved. And we'll talk a little bit more about that soon. Let's go to verses six and seven and I'll read them. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus in that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Well, I'm gonna tell you, I'm very excited about verses six and seven. They are exciting. We learned in Ephesians already that Christ is seated in heavenly places, in heavenly realms, and he's doing that in his physical body, his ascended body. For, uh, chapter 1, verse 20 taught us that. Well, verse 6 here is teaching us that believers are spiritually seated with Christ in that heavenly realm, that we are united with Christ in his resurrection, which is... It's a hard perspective to grasp <laughs> in our pea little brains. Still, in reality, this royal privilege to be enthroned with Christ is ours. I don't know what that's going to look like in heaven exactly, but it's going to be very well known to all of us that we are part of his throne as his children. You and I are exalted daughters of God. Have you seen people wear crowns in a lot of pride? Very, very prideful of their crowns? We won't be those kind of daughters, will we? We will know that we come from a humble origin of sin, and we've been raised up because of what Christ has done for us. And so we are going to actually participate in Christ's exaltation. We're going to be receiving the consequent uh, results of his, his victory dying on the cross. And one day we will partake of his fullness of his glory. Heaven is going to be an amazing place for us. And if that's not enough, there's what verse seven says. It says that the age, in the ages to come that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ. Did you catch that? Do you understand what that is saying to us? It's saying that God intends to blow our ever-loving minds when we're in heaven because he is going to continue and continue to demonstrate his grace toward us, his grace, his kindness, his favor, his generosity, his goodness in age after age after age throughout all eternity. This is what he's going to do with his sons and daughters. In heaven, we will be blessed and spoiled children by his excellent hand over and over again because we are his magnum opus. We are God's most important work of grace. And God will never stop dealing with us on the basis of grace. There's not gonna come a point, it's like, okay, done, you're in jail, you gotta earn your way out, you know, uh, pay, pay your bail. No, we will always be de dealt with by his grace. And uh, he will continue to demonstrate grace to toward us. And as that happens, age after age, and who knows what God has coming in the future, it will be known that God is a God of divine nature, full of grace, full of goodness, full of kindness, full of mercy. It will, it will be that magnificence of who he is will be shown in how he takes care of us. Can you imagine how special are we to the Lord? 
Remember, grace is, un, is unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor and kindness. Grace is a free will act of God toward those who put their faith in Christ. So then, where is, um, I want to mention mercy, where mercy is not getting what you deserve. It's, you don't, you're not getting what you deserve. You're not receiving separation from God or punishment from God. Grace is getting um, what you do not deserve, which is salvation, a relationship with God, and all the glories of heaven. Some fittingly coined the acrostic for grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's grace and beautiful favor. Uh, eight and nine, verses eight and nine say, for by, God, by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So faith here is that human response of belief or conviction that leads you to reliance on Jesus Christ for salvation. That is what faith is. It leads you to reliance on Christ for salvation. If God's grace is the grounds of salvation, then faith is how we appropriate it. Does that make sense? Rather than the grounds of good works or the law or good deeds. Salvation is a gift, it says. A gift is a thing given willingly to someone without payment, without cost. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lest anyone would boast. No one will boast when they come to heaven. No one will take credit for being there or have anything good to say of themselves. All our praise will be to our Lord Jesus. Galatians 2.16 says, yet we know that a person is justified or made right with God by faith in Jesus, not obeying the law. So this theological argument was very important uh, to keep Jews and Gentiles from turning back to the dead um, traditions of the Old Testament. So this is actually a very important teaching. Do you know there's a lot of movement toward uh, Christians moving back to the law, moving back to those old Jewish traditions, but we don't need to. That's not what saves us. What saves us is Jesus Christ. All of those traditions looked, looked ahead for, to Jesus Christ, right? To the cross, to his death for us. And so it, now that it's done, all we need to do is believe in him. So let's move to verse 10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So uh, that we are his workmanship means that we are God's creation. He created us. Psalm 100 verse three says, know that the Lord, he is God. He, it is he who has made us and not we ourselves. But because God is our creator, we were created in the highest skill level you could ever have, ever, ever. And that makes us of high value. We can compare this to the idea of the art world, the most skillful artist. Their works are worth the most, right? They have the highest financial value. But nobody could ever compare to creator God. Created in Christ Jesus for good works is kind of like uh, they're just opposed. We are not saved through works, right? And yet we were created to do good works, which is a very interesting how they put that together, how the Lord put that together. And so it's teaching us that we are designed to, make, to um, perform good works, to, to serve. And it's something that comes out of our outflow of our relationship with Jesus. As we love him, as we grow in him, as we know him, naturally, we're just gonna wanna be a blessing to others. Titus 3.14 says, let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, to help cases of urgent need, and not be unfruitful. Do you remember the story of Dorcas? Dorcas' story was in Acts 9. In verse 36, it says, at Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. Her story continues and it shares that Dorcas died. And she had many, many mourners who were grieving her loss. Mourners who had experienced her love, her kindness, her generosity through her sewing ministry. Yeah, 
Sewing. Sewing's a good thing. <laughs> I love to sew. It's a good thing. God used her through this ministry of sewing. And so it, it's Acts 9, 39 says, all the widows stood by Peter, weeping, showing the tunics and the garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. What a precious picture that is of a sister just having loved and spent her life doing for others and being a blessing to them. Those tunics represented her, uh, the good works of a very good woman. She lived others-oriented, and we know that God is calling us to live other or others-oriented lives. What good works will follow you on the day of judgment when all our deeds will be examined? Prepare a meal, babysit for a friend, give a ride, pay a bill, pray for others through their trials, that's appreciated. That does so much more than we ever give it credit for. Serve in children's church or oversee ministry, support a missionary, send a card. The, the great thing about good works is that there's no cookie cutter way. There's so many ways we can serve the Lord with good works. Don't compare to anybody else. Listen to the Lord. Let him put burden on your heart. Let him show you the need. And when he shows it to you, respond. Do what you can. Sometimes we get, it gets so big in our mind that we just say, I'm not gonna do it at all. But do what you can, right? If he's putting it on your heart, there's something you can do. And don't think of whatever it is you have to do as just too little. Don't do that to yourself. Just do that little bit. Be obedient, responsive to the Lord. I, I remember wanting to give to um, a particular min, uh, ministry and not having the money to do it. And it just, I wanted to so much, but I couldn't ask my husband to do that with our budget. So I just prayed, Lord, would you give me some money to give to them? And I got money in the mail, and I don't know who sent it to me, in an envelope. And I, and I gave it. Isn't that crazy? Boy, do we limit how God might work in our lives. So if you have a burden, just pray, Lord, am I to fulfill this in any way or any part of this and see what he might do? And you know, sometimes the answer is no, I, I don't have that for you. That's not for you. I didn't prepare that beforehand for you to do. I have somebody else in mind and we could be at peace about that. So let's remember that good works are a fruit of our salvation. They're not the cause or basis for our salvation. But also, that fruit of service will bear you a great reward. Jesus said in Revelation 22, 12, and behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. So, Let's think about the keys of this, these several verses. Um, first, for, verses four through 10 is that the believers are seated together with Christ in heavenly places and will be recipients of God's grace forever. And then we'll move on to our last section. He is our peace, verses 11 through 22. Let's read 11 through 13. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by what is called circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promises, promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, you, are one, you who were once so far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So again, Paul talks about the former condition of believers when we were unbelievers. And it's a spe specifically speaking of Gentiles. Initially, all of God's laws and covenant promises were given to the Jews, Jews in exclusion of Gentiles. So God's covenant with the Jews encompassed many things like promises of provision, promises of protection, and an expansion as well of their people and extended to those eternal blessings that come through the Messiah. Well, that covenant then was handed down from the beginning with Abraham and it was sealed with circumcision. You know, they cut off the foreskin. You know what that is. <laughs> Every male in Abraham's house was to be circumcised. And after, after that, every male of his seed was to be circumcised on the eighth day after their birth. The circumcision of the Jews signified their separation from the world to God. On the other hand, 
Gentiles were the uncircumcision because of their exclusion from the covenant. But the good news is in verse 13, it says that Christ shed blood on the cross, opened the door of salvation for Gentiles. In fact, Romans 2, 29 says, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly and um, circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not the letter, um, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So this scripture is telling us a Jew is not a Jew is one who is uh, set apart from God and have, through their faith in Jesus Christ. It's not through the work of the hands, the actual physical circumcision. It's having your heart set apart from God, and so it's not uh, for the praise of men and like I've been circumcised, I'm set apart, I'm God's. No, it's about your heart being separated from the world and separated to God. Verses 14 through 17, and I'm going to read those. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so, that, so as to create in himself one new man from two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile with both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death enmity. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For he is our peace, who has made both one. He's broken down the middle wall of separation between believing Jews and believing Gentiles. You know, the temple had an outer courtyard. And this was the area where Gentiles could worship Yahweh. Did you know that? That there was an area that God had set apart for the Gentiles to worship him and even sacrifice to him? But they could go no further than that court. There was a physical barrier, an actual wall of separation between the Jews and the Gentiles uh, where they could worship. That barrier represents how far off the Gentiles were from the Jewish God and his people. Well, there were actual notifications posted at the different entrances of the t uh, temple uh, that would warn any Gentile if they entered that that was punishable by death. And yet, the Gentile court existed. And what that preaches to me is that God had always had an intention and a desire to bring those, those Gentiles near. By the way, a Gentile is anybody who's not Jewish by ancestry. That's what it, and so that's the separation between them. But what kept Gentiles at a distance? What was really the issue? David Gusick wrote, or the Gentiles and the Jews, they had this distance. There was a kind of a hatred um, between them. David Gusick wrote, the source of contention between Jews and Gentiles was the fact that the Gentiles did not keep the law. But since Jesus fulfilled the law on our behalf, and bore the penalty for our failures to keep the law, we are reconciled through his work on the cross, putting to get death the source of contention. Verses 14 through 17. He is our peace. Through faith in Christ, the Messiah, that wall of separation was broken down for the Jews and Gentiles. And as we've learned, they be, we have become one body or one man in unity of fellowship now. Verse 15 teaches there, there's no longer enmity or sp a spiritual hostility between us Jews and Gentiles who were previously bound by this religious separation. The Jews of Paul's time struggled with, to accept Gentiles and needed this truth to be clear. And then the Gentiles also needed the assurance with what high ground they stood for their salvation. And so that's why he's bringing these matters up before them. Let's read verses 18 through 22, our last portion. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Notice right there, verse 18, 
Through him, Jesus, we both, Jews and Gentiles, have access by one spirit to the Father. All three members of the Trinity are at work to bring access to, the, uh, uh, to us for the presence of God, both Jews and Gentiles. This kind of access that, that the Jews were being offered through Christ was something the average Jew had never experienced. In fact, they'd never dreamed they would experience this. Only the high priest could ever go into the temple and go visit the mercy seat and be there in the presence of God in that way. And certainly we know since the, the Gentiles could never go that far, they were not permitted to either. But now access to God is wide open 24-7 for all who believe in Christ for salvation. I know that we don't have face-to-face. -face. I know that we're not right there yet. We're, we're getting close. Be aware, we're getting very close. But we have access. I can be in his presence. I can call out his name. He hears me. He responds. He's there for me. He's as real as anything. He's re more real than a person next to you. He's God and he's alive. And so access 24-7, whatever you're going through, whenever you're going through, wherever you're going through, it doesn't matter. He is there for you and you can call on his name. And I hope that you're taking advantage of that, pri that privilege day and night, day and night, calling out to him. I've been trying to diet and I'm gonna tell you I've been calling on the name of Jesus a lot. I have never thought of cinnamon rolls and cake more than my life than I have recently. <laughs> And I literally have to go, okay, Father, cleanse my mind of these things. <laughs> Put them far from me. But he's helping me day by day. I'm literally being helped by him. And my heart and my attitude are changing. And those things are getting further from me. But I call on him. I depend on him. I trust in him. And that's what we all have to do with our particular set of circumstances. Cry out, Daddy, Father, King, Lord, Almighty, gift giver, promise keeper, lover of my soul, husband, shepherd, mighty fortress, the great I am. He is everything we need. Scripture describes the members of God's newly formed church, not just here, but also other scriptures. And it talks about the fact that the Jews and, Jews and Gentiles are making up a building for God's presence to dwell in. And it calls us living stones. The Jews and Gentiles, as they're coming to faith, they're being built upon one upon another. And this is going to be a habitation for God where he lives and dwells. The cornerstone being Jesus Christ. Now, expositor Solomon wrote, cornerstone denotes the stone placed at the extreme corner so as to bind the other stones in the building together. The most important stone in the structure, the one on which its stability depends. So this new church that's being formed with Jesus as a cornerstone is so strong that Jesus said, all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Jesus has protected us and we are his church and we will remain strong. We will move from this world and this life to our heavenly one. So let's go, let's review what we learned tonight in chapter two. Through Christ, God has transformed sinners and trespassers into saints. He has transported every believer from eternal death to eternal life. We are seated with Christ in, in heaven. A spectacular destiny awaits us. Believing Jews and Gentiles form one new body, one dwelling place for God. Jesus is the bridge of peace between Jews and Gentiles. God calls you to bless and serve others in good works. God's access or access to God's presence is available to you 24 seven. And Jesus is the cornerstone forming the church of which his presence will dwell. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the multitude of promises in just one chapter. Our future is glorious, it's sure, it's protected because of your love and mercy for us. We thank you for your grace and your amazing intentions to bring us closer to yourself. We pray the enemy would be far from us and we would choose you each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs>